You are listening to episode 46. This episode is brought to you by my new course, How to Dominate LinkedIn with Your Personal Brand. Do you feel like when you're on the LinkedIn platform, you're not really sure how to actually navigate it? Does it feel clunky or confusing? And do you have all these connections, but you're not sure how to really leverage those connections and how to really show up virtually in presenting your personal brand? Well, that is what this course is about because since September, I've gone from 1,500 connections to about 8,000 connections on LinkedIn. Not only that, I've gotten clients through my content and people have actually reached out to me to speak for virtual speaking engagements. So if this is something that you would really like to capitalize on and take advantage of and learn about, then this course is definitely for you. And you can learn about it more uh, in my show notes and I will have the link to the wait list just for you. And now on with the show. On today's episode, I'm so excited. I know you guys hear me say that every time probably, but I love doing what I do and interviewing inspirational people. And today I get to interview Grace Okafor or Dr. Gio as her brand name. And what's really cool about Grace is she is a Nigerian Igbo woman who lives in Korea. And she went there on the basis of learning about Korean beauty. And what she has done is something that's never been done before. And she has created a brand for women of color using the expertise of Korean beauty inside the brand itself. This is special for so many reasons. There's so many amazing things um, to learn about skincare that can be learned from Korean beauty for one. It's always a very acclaimed way of doing skincare. And number two, because there's not a lot of women of color in Korea or in certain countries in Asia, it's actually hard for them to source this kind of makeup. They either have to try and import it from the States and all that, but no one's actually created a brand for people within that region. So I was so excited to interview her as someone who loves going to different Asian countries myself. And uh, that was just something I hadn't really thought about in terms of if I was there for a longer period of time, how would I actually source some of these things? So It's a very fascinating story and I learned so much and I hope you enjoy this episode today. Welcome to the Okiki Podcast, where we make inspirational people known. Brought to you by your host, Fian O'Brien. And welcome to the Okiki Podcast. And today I have Grace Akofor. Uh, she's Nigerian, which I'm really excited about because if for the listeners of this podcast, you know I'm Nigerian as well. And uh, she has an amazing brand in Korea called Dr. Geo. And I actually found her on a YouTube channel that I am subscribed to called Black Experience Japan. I think they've changed it to just Black Experience Stories, but I was so intrigued by her story because I love seeing Black people who travel and want to see other parts of the world. (laughs) And those are countries I definitely uh, want to go to. So I am so happy to have you here on the podcast today, Grace. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And for the audience, they should know it's uh, very early over there for you. (laughs) I believe it's 5 (laughs) a.m. 
Yes, it's 5 a.m. here. Yeah. <laughs> so I really appreciate you being on the show today. So please give us some of your background. Was your journey, uh, have you, were you always in Korea? Did you grow up there? Uh, what was your journey to actually getting to the country in the first place? Oh, okay. Um, so I was born and raised in Nigeria. Um, actually uh, from the southeastern side of Nigeria. So um, I, I'm actually Igbo by tribe. And then, yeah, I did all my high school and um, university uh, in the southeastern part of Nigeria before I moved to the northern part, Abuja, where I got a job and, you know, I rose to become the uh, business manager of a unit of a civil, um, of a cinema. It's kind of actually one of the biggest cinemas in West Africa, Silverbed Cinemas. So it was while I was there that I thought of doing my master degree somehow. And uh, I didn't know in Asia, I didn't know where to go. So until a friend of mine kind of directed me to South Korea. So I went to the Korean Cultural Center, which was right behind my office. And that was how I got to know South Korea. And then why at the Korean Cultural Center, I came across K-Beauty through a free gift, uh, a free mask sheet issued by my uh, then uh, Korean teacher. And that also raised my interest in, you know, uh, bringing in uh, uh, Korean beauty uh, companies into Africa, because then what we had was just products from China and uh, Europe, you know. So all in all, like, um, I guess my journey to South Korea started uh, when I began to think of how to do my master's degree in international business, right? And um, I was intrigued because what we have in Nigeria then, what we had in Nigeria then was mostly things from China, but the only things we had from Korea was just electronics and cars, you know, and that was it. So yeah, and I guess that's where the beginning of my journey to South Korea. That's incredible. That's really cool. Uh, I love how you brought up your Evo because I have a little bit of Evo. I mean, I always tell people. <laughs> <laughs> my my grandma was Evo, so I'm always like, yes, I got a little bit, and I'm really proud of that. But obviously, entrepreneurialism is huge for that, and um, it's really cool to hear that it really began with relationship and you seeing things that were missing in the market, and how can I bring those how can I bridge those two together? And then you were looking at international business. So it's really um, the masters that kind of took you then over there. And so yeah. what was your journey then of being in Korea, being in this new culture? Uh, did you learn Korean? And uh, how did you begin to, I guess, go from I'm here to study to I'm here to create something and possibly live here. What was that journey for you as well? Um, so uh, I came in through the Korean government scholarship program. And before um, you get selected, um, you have to write like um, your plan, your study plan and what you intend to do. So actually one of the reasons I think I got selected was because uh, I, right before I left Nigeria, my goal was to bridge the gap between Korea and Africa, starting with Nigeria. So I told them that. What I just basically told you was what I wrote in my study plan, like um, I'm coming here to study this. And uh, the goal is to use what I learned from here to bridge the gap between your country and my country and the rest of the continent. So, and, you know, I got selected. We, it was like just four of us you know, from Nigeria at that time in 2015. So um, under this program, it's you're meant to do one year Korean language, basically to introduce you into the culture. And so that by the time you start your studies, you should be able to communicate, right? So yeah, I, I basically did the one year Korean language studies before I did my two years master degree. Wow. So you actually learned how to to understand the language and communicate. Yes. It. That's amazing. Yes. Awesome. And so was it then during your master's that you were like, you know, I think I could spend some more time out here. I think I can, uh, you know, <laughs> start a life out here. What, what was that transition for you? I think before coming, I had 
the knowledge that I would spend more time after my uh, master degree because um, to start a business would take you know some years and stuff. And uh, if you're to network with Korean companies, you can't do that under on one day. You have to like <laughs> so. Um, it was at the back of my mind that after my studies, I'm going to be in Korea for a while. So while I was doing my master's degree, I started the process of how to register a company in Korea. Like I started looking out for information, data, and that. And uh, I joined um, this um, the Seoul Global Startup Center's uh, website to look up information and like anything that had to do with startup and stuff. And so while I was actually doing my master's degree was when I started um, the process of, you know, moving uh, from a student when I graduate to having a startup uh, visa, you know, uh, yeah. So you transitioned, you began the research and then you transitioned from the student visa to the startup visa. Very yeah. cool. And so were you always thinking of makeup? Was that your original business intention? Um, and was that the first thing you launched? Or um, what was your first business ideas when you were going into the startup visa phase? Actually, the uh, the makeup uh, in business was not my original intention. The goal was to, like I said, you know, bring in uh, Korean beauty companies into uh, Africa or make it very easy for them to reach out to Africa. So. Um, I built a platform, you know, be official, connecting uh, Korean beauty SMEs, like small, medium enterprises to, you know, directly to Africans. So Africans don't really, it's just, you just go to a website, look at products and buy and stuff. So uh, that was the original intention, right? But then before, um, when I came to Korea, um, I mean, before I came, I was looking at YouTube and I was seeing, like, I, I needed to know a bit more about people who are already living here, right? So I was looking up at YouTube videos like Black Women in Korea, the, the experiences, and everyone was like, oh, if you're coming to Korea as a Black woman, you need to stock up on your cosmetics. There is none for you here. <laughs> you know? So I was like, okay. So I stocked up on, you know, my, actually then I used to use a, uh, a French uh, brand um, and Milani so and uh, it was quite easy for me to get it in Nigeria because they moved imported from Ivory Coast right which is a French colony so it was very easy to get it in uh, Nigeria then so but it was quite expensive compared to other brands uh, China you know made in China brands but I I was I stopped them because those Chinese brands were not good for me at all so um I stocked up and when I came to Korea, I quickly ran out of my, you know, my cosmetics. So I decided, okay, um, let me see if I could get from the States to ship to Korea or even look around in Korea. And that was when I truly understood what those ladies were saying in YouTube. <laughs> so, and I'm like, Korea has this amazing cosmetics, you know, the cushion and I mean, lipstick. I mean, I mean, it's lipsticks. Why don't we, why, why don't you have something that can be used by everyone, right? Or so I just said, okay, while I'm working on bridging the gap between Korea and Africa, I might as also start off uh, with creating a brand here, you know, for Black women living in Korea and or any person of color interested in K-beauty to have access to their products. So I thought of, okay, why not also make K-beauty inclusive and diverse while I'm working on, I mean, if I'm to take them to Africa, they should have inclusive products, right? So, and that was how uh, my second uh, uh, company, Dr. Gio, started. Okay, yeah. So I want to backtrack for the audience because I think you said some very cool things. So you technically produced two companies at once. One was the original <laughs> plan you went with of how do I connect K-beauty to Africa, essentially, because I agree with you, like you said, I'm yet to try Korean beauty products, but I've heard a lot of amazing things about them. And it's kind of like world known now with the I don't know, I think K-pop and everything has really made people more aware of some of the things in Korea, including K-beauty. Um, then on the flip side, you're like, wait, there's this opportunity to be inclusive because 
um, given the population, they're probably more used to having shades for their population um, yes. compared to foreigners. So of course, mm -hmm. how do you even find our shades? It was even hard to find them in North America, let alone in Korea. I think Rihanna was groundbreaking for her Fenty line for that exact reason, right? And yes. why for years that North America has had multiculturalism, that it took someone like her to really be like, I'm going to put every shade available. So I agree with you that there's always that gap to fill, <laughs> especially when you're dealing with uh, Black people uh, for the makeup industry. So given that you're trying to do something very creative there with having the K-beauty, having the ingredients, having their processes that they're so well known for, and combining that then with the shade that would represent Africa, what was now that you had that idea, how how did you go about trying to make this happen? What was your biggest obstacle of being like, how am I going to actually make this possible? Um, so, you know, when we started, um, we were basically bootstrapping. You know, everything was coming from my my pocket. My, I was making a lot of expenses. And, you know, in Korea, um, they're very strict with the visa. If you're on a student visa, you focus on being a student and uh, you're just allowed some internships. So um, if you want to work, it's like teaching or something, you have a visa for that. And for that, it's limited to some countries. So um, I guess for me, it was actually very difficult to um, like, you know, raise money, say, through working because I had to be on a visa to do that. If not, I, will, I would be breaking the law, right? So um, so I was basically bootstrapping and stuff and um, you know, making a lot of expenses, but no income. You know, at some point I was actually living with a friend. I couldn't pay her uh, the rents, you know, and um, right before she was to, you know, leave for Japan, she needed the money um, that I had been owing her, you know, so also she could use it for, you know, moving to Japan. That was like late uh, 2019, um, early January 2020. So at that moment, I almost gave up, like, you know, I mean, if I'm to do this, where, <laughs> where do I get the funds from? And, and I've been pitching and stuff. Uh, so, I mean, the Seoul Global Startup Center gave me the opportunity to start from somewhere. But I mean, if you have to create a brand, you need money to do that, <laughs> at least like $40,000 or or so. Where would I get such money? <laughs> so, you know, it was at that point, like it's either I do this or I just go back to, you know, Nigeria, maybe, you know, um, I don't like, I was just worried, like, is this how my dream will end? But then I decided, okay, let me give this one more trial. Um, so Korea has this um, Korea Credit Guarantee System where the government helps you to uh, get funds. They basically guarantee you. So they make it easy for the banks to um, give you the money you need, you know. So I thought that was mainly for Koreans. But then something just, okay, why not try as a foreigner, see what would happen, right? Just tell them what you want to do and, I mean, see... It's a, a yes or a no. So that was my last uh, shot. And I tried that and the rest is history. <laughs> so like that was that was it. <laughs> wow. I feel like there's so much in there. So uh, you mentioned how there was like a Korea uh, Seoul Startup Center, but that's kind of gets you going as a startup, but you still need to secure the funding. And then yeah. you did, you just tried to see would they fund a foreigner and the rest is history. So in that, what did, so they gave you funds. How were you able then to put that together and create a brand that people wanted? Um, so I guess I have two questions to that. A, how did you source, like, how were you like, hey, how am I going to find these pigments and colors? Because that to me is <laughs> my initial <laughs> confusion with, with how you're able to go about it. And secondly, how did you create a brand that was attractive then out there um, that could really sustain itself, as you were mentioning. Okay, so um, first of all, um, I basically went to the markets to see what shades are out there already. And um, I was like, okay, like I had to do a lot of research. I, I think I looked at a lot of the people on YouTube because my I wanted to start with the Black women living in Korea because they would be the first to 
test the product and give me their reviews and stuff. So for the shades, I had to look at what what, what is the maximum, like what shades are the people living in Korea, what are they, like the range of shades. So let me start with those. And then they from their feedback, we could, you know, I, in fact, I saw this, uh, the first product as my prototype, <laughs> you know, you know, in technology, they call it prototype or so. So I basically saw it as my prototype. So I'm um, looking at their videos and stuff and then going to the market. I looked at other brands, what shades like they had. So it's like, I had to keep testing on myself. Okay. So what is like, I, I kind of kept mixing and stuff and I said, okay. Then I arrived at um, six colors because remember, I'm not just targeting only black women. I'm also looking at people of color, like, you know, Afro Asians, um, Indians, like dark skin tones from Asia and stuff. So like it took, I think that's why it took us almost 10 months because I kept on, you know, sending it back to the uh, manufacturer that, no, that's not the right shade I want. Like, you know, so I guess like it took a long time, but my goal first was the women in Korea. And then from then we could expand. And then from what the global market says, we now know the right shades to um, produce. Very cool. So even though, and I can relate to the tech thing because I'm doing a women in tech program right now, I totally know what you're saying, like the prototyping. Figure yeah. out what does the market want? Like, what are the shades of the people of color that actually live in Korea? So that that's mm-hmm. really cool in your process. And then so once you um, and you said that whole testing actually took up 10 months. So that's really cool. So obviously it was very thought out and, and um, reiterated quite a few times. And then w- from there, how did you go about like the brand creation and the brand promotion in Korea then to uh, let people know that, hey, we have this brand. Uh, you can see her beautiful background like where did that come into play and what was the process of developing that actually dr joe has not really done any brand promotion or like in terms of professional brand promotion what i did um i just did uh uh, because of the COVID-19 too, we had to be very careful of, uh, you know, you know, gatherings and stuff. So what I did was uh, we had a pre-introduction event. So um, uh, once the, uh, the, the first batch of products were ready um, and I looked it up, it was all good and stuff. I said, okay, let, now it's good for me. But would it be good for them? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, okay, I just went to a Facebook group, uh, Black Women in, uh, in Korea, BWIK, and I'm like, hi, my name is this. Like, I just introduced, I think if you go to UC, if you see that post, like, I just introduced myself, I created this, and um, now I would love uh, to have. Uh, 50 women who want to come to the event because we are limited by the government to have a a maximum of 50 at that time and um, people who would love to come and try the product and give me their honest feedback and stuff and that was just what we did that you know started the ball rolling people started telling their friends about it and And, you know, from Korea, because you had a lot of African-Americans living in Korea, you know, so from there, they told their friends in the U.S., U.K. and stuff. And um, I was like, okay, this is moving quite fast. (laughs) So I quickly, like, created it because I told them, look, I've not launched. uh, This is just me giving you guys this to test and give me your feedback so I know what to do. So, but when I saw the way like people were, where do we buy my friends wants to buy and stuff? So I quickly created a website <laughs> like, oh yeah, they can buy it from there and stuff. And, and we've not really done any marketing actually. So uh, right now, the only thing we are doing is um, brand awareness and like, you know, people trying the product and giving us feedback. So it sounds like you already kind of had the... I guess the benefit that you had pre-researched this market, like you already knew this was a problem <laughs> yeah. that people were looking for it. And you kind of just were, were dropped right into the group and said, Hey, I think I may have a solution. Let me know what you think. And mm-hmm. it kind of escalated from there because people already were looking for this solution. So yeah. that's really yeah. awesome. 
And you mentioned that you had to be low key about it during because of COVID. So was this actually launched during COVID? And like you said, you had to create a site. So was this like, uh, I know over here we have Shopify. I don't know if Shopify works in uh, Korea, but uh, did you have to kind of set up some sort of like WooCommerce or something like that to kind of get things going? And yeah, how's that been going? Like, did it still do super well in spite of the circumstance? Um, so um, we launched uh, November 14th, pre- uh, not launched. We introduced the brand November 14th, which, you know, COVID was still, uh, COVID is still <laughs> not even was. So it's, it was during the period of the pandemic here. Yeah. And I, I actually affected uh, the way we made the product because while we were testing and this was going on, I, and I saw that a lot of people stopped wearing makeup. Um, we decided to create something that, would, you know, when you wear it and you wear the mask, you don't need to worry about the mask, you know, the breakouts and stuff. Uh, because we that's why we added a lot of skincare ingredients to suit the skin and uh, like a lot of, so actually the pandemic helped us to make the product more skincare infused and stuff. So it was introduced during the pandemic. And um, we, so as soon as I saw how this was going, I quickly went to Shopify, (laughs) you know, and like created, if you look at my page, trust me, a professional will tell you it's not a professional website. <laughs> it was just basically something I set up just for people who want to buy the product to have somewhere to, you know, be able to uh, buy it. Yeah. So with time, um, because what we are actually working on expanding the shades and stuff. So um, I don't want to do a professional branding now with just six shades. Um, like I said, I see it as a prototype. So once we expand to like, um, like 20 shades and with other products, you know, then you would see like the full launch of uh, Dr. Geo Cosmetics as, you know, a, a brand. I find that really interesting that you're like, we're actually still just starting because, um, it's already gotten a lot of attention, of course, over there. So I guess my other question to you too is when it took off and when the word of mouth was really going, were you finding that you were also getting demand from uh, black women, women of color in other Asian countries as well? Um, you know, like the, the neighbors, um, Singapore, um, you know, Japan, and even China, were you starting to get some of that demand as well? No, it was mostly from Korea and the States um, until I, um, I think um, it was when I did the Black Experience stories that I kind of got a few um, interest from women living in Japan because they were worried, do I ship to Japan also? Um, So, and then, you know, other ethnicities like, you know, dark skin Asians and stuff. I've not really promoted towards them or like even asked them. I just had a model from India, you know, to show that we also uh, cater to people outside, uh, you know, um, dark, uh, deep skin tones. So, but for now, we are kind of, I'm kind of focused on uh, trying to um, create more deep skin tones, you know, and um, because it's, It's a whole lot. I mean, if you check the reviews, a lot of people were criticizing me. (laughs) Like, as as a Black woman, why did you just make three shades for deep skin tones? (laughs) And that that, kind of hurts, like, (laughs) ish. But then I'm taking it step by step. You know, remember, I... It's kind of bootstrapping for me, but I guess should we get uh, funded or invested in, then we can easily, like Rihanna, you know, incorporate everybody. And but right now we are bootstrapping, so I need to take it step by step. I think that's a fair point you made because I think there's the two two sides, right? Like as a black person, it's always uh, a little difficult when you try to find those shades, and luckily, like brands like hers or like at least in North America like Maybelline, Revlon, they've they've done a pretty good job of having the range. But um even given what you said about Rihanna, she did partner with another company to create that brand. Mm-hmm. I think it's like L- LMDH. Um and yeah. so it wasn't 
completely bootstrapped, even though she probably had some of the means to do so. I mean, she has money. <laughs> yeah, think of what <laughs> artist she is. So I think that's it's very notable to say that you bootstrapped it to this point where it's actually something that can be sold to people. Um, so along that lines, I wanted to ask, what is your vision for Dr. Geo in the next five years? Where, where do you see this company going? And, and what are some of the opportunities and trends you're seeing emerging as a result of how online we are these days? So, um, you know, in international trade, we say the world is a globalized uh, village now, right? So for me, I think beauty should not just be restricted to a country, right? So just for like K-beauty now, um, I think even though it's called Korean beauty, right? But it should also incorporate everybody. So I don't want to lose the cultural aspect of Korean beauty while I'm trying to make it inclusive. So what Dr. Zhu aims at is to be a multicultural brand. So we take the scientific aspects of the Korean beauty industry, their skills, the way they produce cosmetics and skincare and you know, all this stuff. And then we also uh, incorporate ingredients from Africa, you know, from the, where I'm from and stuff and from the global world. And we create something for people of color. So actually my motto is made by us for us, you know, made by a person of color for people of color, black K-beauty. So, I mean, it's really like, I don't even know how it's going to go, but I want to build, I mean, Korea, like you said, Korean wave is becoming like something huge. So right now, while it's growing and stuff, I also want K-Beauty to, you know, grow towards allowing other people to be a part of it. So I hope in the next five years, um, Dr. Zhou will be, you know, one of the biggest, if not a multicultural brand that embraces Korea and Africa, you know, culture and stuff. Like we, uh, we just, I just call it Black K-Beauty. <laughs> Yeah, that's really amazing and really fascinating. And I think it is a really cool opportunity and good timing too. I know there's a lot of um, Black people who are into Korean culture, Korean beauty. I personally have been to Japan and I want to go again. And I think there's even an opportunity there. So I even think <laughs> just having something for them in these um in these countries is really cool but I also on the flip side think it's cool that again because Korea has began to influence the states so much um, I do think that even the the market of black people there is so so large so I I, I do I see a lot of opportunities for you in, in so many directions thank you and I'm really looking forward to seeing the progression of this brand and, and product before I let you go, I just wanted to ask, is there any anything, any promo or any kind of project or launch you want our audience to know about today? Um, okay, so uh, because we are trying to raise funds and, you know, most people, when they come and they say we just have six shades and stuff, they think, oh, okay, I'll just wait for you till you, you know, launch the product. So I'm like, Okay, but I mean, I created the gift cards and I'm like, you can basically buy ahead and uh, like just uh, for me, I see it as crowdfunding, you know, instead of me going to Indiegogo or Kickstarter and like, you could just buy our gift cards. And when we launch products, you know, it the gift card doesn't expire. You can use it anytime to buy any product you want. You could even buy for your friends and stuff they can use it anytime so I tell people even though you don't see your shade or you don't see anything that interests you from Dr. Zhu if you believe in our goal and our mission you could just help us by buying our gift cards because we'll use that money to develop products and stuff just like crowdfunding is done right so that and then I mean I can also offer like some discount from to your fans <laughs> you know I guess I could called a um, okiki something this card i mean you tell me what 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 unique name you want me to give it and uh, we could offer them 10 percent discount for everything like for anything they buy on the platform i actually think that's a cool idea so i'll probably have to talk to you after the episode about that. <laughs> and uh, also 
yeah, genuinely wanted to connect too. Cause like I said, I want to go there. I think my sister um, may be going to uh, that country at some time. So I will connect her with your brand too, because I think she'll be very happy to know <laughs> that thank she you. can get herself some makeup while she's there. So I just wanted to say thank you again, Grace, for being on the Okiki podcast and, and sharing your value of your journey with our audience today. Thank you for having me. <laughs>